nine. Okay, cool. So uh, next dog's up. So one round of applause for Dario. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. So I'm Dario Dinucci. I'm a research fellow here in Brussels. So uh, actually, I didn't work a lot to arrive here. But I work in the, in the sister university of WLB. So I work in the Frey University of Brussels. If you've been in Brussels for a couple of days, you know some stories about Brussels. So I've never been in Sorbosch. So today I'm going to talk with you about uh, mining source code, about mining idiom, usages, and uh, edits. Actually, I will show you that uh, these different aspects in, the, in reality have a lot in common. And uh, I will try to show you the limitation that uh, we have in applying this kind of uh, techniques but also uh, the novelty of applying this kind of techniques and uh, the advantages that we could have uh, in a few years of research. So actually, I'm a standard researcher in Europe, so I moved a bit uh, during my life. Uh, I'm not Belgian, I'm, I'm Italian. I'm a, an Italian from the south. Uh, but then during uh, the last years I was in uh, uh, I work in Deft, and uh, after a while uh, I moved uh, to uh, Brussels. Uh, so today I'm going to talk with you about uh, mining software repositories. Uh, uh, we could think about that a software repository is just uh, a Git repository or uh, maybe an issue tracker. But actually, when we talk about software repositories, we talk about uh, not only versioning systems and the issue tracker, but also about uh, marketplaces or about uh, uh, communication in which, in which uh, you developers, you store all your information. So actually what we would like to do is to gather this information, to mine uh, these repositories, just to extract this data and to create a common history for a, a software project. So, after having all this information, what we can do is that we can, for example, apply machine learning techniques, and uh, today you heard a lot about this. But why we need this? Because uh, actually, if you think about, you are providing a lot of data to uh, public repositories, but there is something that these repositories can do for you. And uh, actually, this is what we are trying to do. So actually, we are trying to get all your information, but just to to help you, so to provide you some information that you can, uh, you can, uh, you can use, so that you can reduce the time that you, uh, you spend coding your, uh, your projects. Actually, because no one likes to debug uh, the, the silly mistakes. Uh, so, uh, last year in Brussels, we started a collaboration with a, with a company that is called Raincoat, uh, and is based in Brussels. Uh, so, the, the goal, uh, uh, actually, Raincode is a, is a company that uh, is working on uh, compilers. So they are very good uh, in uh, uh, modernize, uh, modernized uh, uh, software languages. And uh, maybe it seems to be a, a bit strange, but even if uh, today we have uh, really modern languages, we have really a lot of code that actually is still in uh, legacy code. So actually we are trying to help Raincode people to modernize uh, languages. Uh, because uh, actually this is, uh, this is an important market. Uh, there is a, a, a growing needed to, uh, to have this kind of uh, uh, techniques. But one of the problems is that uh, today, what Rinko the people are doing is pretty much manually. So they are doing everything manually without any, any ID or any to support. And uh, for example, just to understand the complexity of what they are doing, in some cases uh, they are trying to replicate the behavior of a compiler without running the compiler. So you have some code, you try to understand uh, how this, works, uh, this code really works, and we are talking about COBOL or something that is uh, stranger than COBOL, and then you have to, to modernize this code to something that uh, you can run on... Uh, Azure on, on your cloud or uh, something like this. I'm talking about Azure because uh, Raincode works with uh, Microsoft. Uh, so the goal of this project uh, is actually to automate the migration uh, that uh, requires pattern uh, discovery. But for doing this, uh, we actually we have uh, 
we are trying to mine uh, uh, three different use cases for three different objectives. So going in details, uh, I will show you that actually uh, mining uh, codidiums or mining uh, library usages or mining uh, systematic edits, and now I will tell you what I'm talking about, is not very different. But why we are trying to do this? So first of all, we would like to comprehend these, uh, these programs. Because uh, the first issue that you have when you work with the legacy code is just to understand what the code is doing. Then, what we would like to do is to do some uh, anomaly detection. So actually, if you have a, a large code base, maybe starting from a new piece of code, you can understand if you are, adding a, a, you are making a mistake. But what is very our final goal is to build a, a full modernization assistance that actually is able to tell you which mistakes you are, you are, you are making and to, to, to create a better, languages, a better language without a lot of effort. So to transpose your code from a language to another. So our approach is actually divided in uh, three different steps. The first step is actually only to import the, the code, because our idea is that uh, this assi assistance, assistance should be a uh, language parameter, so uh, parametric. So what we would like to do is to have a, a common framework that is able to work with uh, different languages, not only COBOL, not only Java, not only Python, but to have a common framework. For doing this, we need a meta model. Actually, this meta model should be able uh, to gather the information and to provide them uh, this information to our algorithms, our pattern mining algorithms. But first of all, we have to work on uh, importing this data. To import this data, actually, uh, at this point of uh, our project, we have different importers. For example, we are able to import uh, uh, Java code from uh, open source uh, projects, but we are also able to import uh, legacy, legacy systems. For example, we are able to import uh, COBOL code. Uh, the second step, after having this, uh, this common uh, meta model, is to run our pattern mining algorithm. How I will show you briefly. In theory, it seems that everything is easy, that we have uh, everything that is needed to deal with this kind of issue. But in practice, I will show you that it's not so easy and maybe we have to, to work several years on this. Then the, the third part is actually to provide the, the patterns that we were able to mine to developers, so that the developers can really understand if there are some common usages for a, for a library or whether there are some syntactic idioms, or for example, uh, whether some commits are uh, repetitive. So first of all, I will uh, just uh, provide you some information about uh, idioms. Actually, this morning, uh, uh, Miltos was talking about uh, idioms. Uh, an idiom is, is just a syntactic fragment, uh, fragment that recurs across the software projects and serves a single semantic purpose. Actually, this definition is a bit uh, bug because uh, uh, it's, it's a bit hard to understand what is really a, an idiom. But let's, let's try to, to just find a, a simple example. So in this case, we have three different uh, pieces of code. And you see that in uh, all this piece of code, you have a, a try, then you have a, a condition, and in this condition, you are invoking the, the method uh, move to first. Then you have a, a body, which you are doing something. And then finally, you have the, um, you have the finally for uh, the, the exception. And then you close this, uh, this object. So, as you can see, in the end, the, these three pieces of code, they are doing actually the same. So, and uh, you can generalize these three pieces of code with, uh, with this, uh, this uh, idiom. And maybe when you have to modernize and to move from uh, a uh, version of your system to another, you can use this kind of information. Now, the problem is that uh, Actually, we are talking about only three piece, pieces of code. And actually, 
it's pretty st straightforward, uh, straightforward uh, to, to understand that these three pieces of code are something in, in common. But when we talk about ecosystems, or when we talk about huge software repositories, in the end we found out that it's not so easy. And of course a developer could not do something like this. So the idea, if we would like to apply a really theoretical approach, is just to run a frequent item set algorithm. So in theory, this problem is not very hard to solve. Because what we can do is that from a piece of code, we just create a representation with a tree, because uh, based, on, uh, the, based on the code, you can uh, just create uh, an abstract syntax tree, and then you can run uh, your, your algorithm, maybe without any problem. But in practice, when you run it, you discover that most of the, the idioms that you find out, in the end, are not so, so interesting. In the end, they are boring. And with boring, we mean that, uh, OK, if I, if I tell you that uh, given a, a Java class, a Java class is composed by attributes and, and methods, then you say that, OK, this is not so, so interesting. It's, it's not a, a something that is new. We know about it. But the problem is that, actually, it's, it's like that you have a trade-off. I mean, from my point of view, you would like to discover very particular, very uh, tricky uh, idioms. But from the other point of view, you have that after a while, your, uh, your search just explodes. So in the end, you are not able to gather patterns. And uh, most of the cases, you have only auto-memory issues. So it's, you, you cannot really do anything. So what we are trying to do is to explore novel pattern mining uh, algorithms for source code. And uh, then we are going uh, to in uh, incorporate this, uh, this, uh, this information in, uh, in our tool. So actually, there are various applications that you, you can use for mining uh, uh, when you mine uh, code uh, idioms. First of all, you could discover new syntactic uh, pattern. Then you could uh, discover pat uh, code that is deviated for, uh, from uh, uh, a pattern. And then you can uh, propose new actions to developers. So this is the overview of our framework. So as I was telling you, uh, telling you in uh, the general view, we have a, a source code importer that uh, is, uh, is able to gather this information uh, in, a, uh, in a common representation. Then we have uh, some mining preprocessors that helps us uh, to clean up the, 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 the representations. And then we have uh, the pattern mining, miner. Actually, it's important to say that now we are running a pretty simple algorithm that is a frequent tree, mine, uh, frequent tree mining. But we are trying to, to explore all the, the possibilities that you have with the, this kind of algorithm. So in the end, uh, using uh, the algorithm per se is not very hard. But uh, adapt this kind of algorithm to our, uh, to, to our uh, case study is not so easy. Also because we have to remember that it's true that we are talking about, at least now for the first year of our project, we are talking about Java projects. But in theory, we would like to apply this knowledge to all the languages. So it's one of the problems is that after that you set up your algorithm, maybe your algorithm will work just for your case study, a really small case study, and will not generalize at all. So uh, after having uh, our pattern miner, and actually we are exploring different kinds of algorithms, uh, the second step, the, the fourth step, uh, is the pattern matcher. So after mining a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of patterns, what you can do is that to, to apply your matcher to discover if in another piece of code you have these patterns. And uh, only after this, uh, you can uh, provide this information to the developers. So that actually developers, uh, the developers will be uh, will able to, to, to improve their code base. So the first problem of uh, this, kind of, uh, um, this kind of application is that it's highly time consuming. And uh, tweaking the algorithm is not so easy. I really, something that uh, is, uh, 
maybe in some cases very uh, people don't consider about much learning is that really every 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 small detail matter and changing a bit the configuration means that in the end you are going to spend a lot of ex execution time and maybe after spending all this time the results that you will have are not not very useful so the another problem that you have is that uh, in some cases, we are able to generate really a large, amount, a large amount of patterns as well as redundant patterns. Some patterns are, mo are more related to the grammar of, to, of the language and not about the use of, your, uh, of the language. So what we are trying to do is that to, to solve these issues, we are trying to put some constraints that help to reduce the search space. Actually, the, the search space in our case is very, very large. Uh, but we are trying to fix uh, these kind of issues. Another problem is that the setting constraints, uh, is that setting the constraints uh, is uh, not so straightforward. I mean, really, every details matter, and setting these, these details is, uh, is not so easy. A another issue, the last one, uh, is that uh, evaluating, and maybe is the most important issue, is that evaluating the patterns it's not easy at all. I mean, one of the issues that we, have, uh, we had in the first year is that uh, we were able to mine patterns. But in the end, uh, even uh, saying what is boring and what is interesting is not so easy. So it means that uh, maybe after hours of computation, we are going to have a lot of patterns, but you don't know whether they are useful or not. And if you don't know this, it means that you are not able to tweak your algorithm. So in summary. We developed uh, a language parameter framework to mine uh, uh, codidiums. Now we are running this kind of uh, algorithm. And uh, we are doing some work in progress to reduce the search space, applying heuristics and constraints. And uh, we are trying to understand uh, the real value of, of idioms to improve the mining, uh, mining process. The second part of my presentation is about mining usages. <coughs> Now, you know the difference between uh, libraries and frameworks. So libraries are different by frameworks because if you would like to use a library, you just need to, to uh, understand the API and to use the APIs. While if you would like to use a framework, actually what you have to do is that you have to implement or to extend some parts of the, of the framework. Now, one of the issues that you have today with framework is that from the point of view of the developer, Actually, you don't know how actually you don't know how to use a, a framework and how to cor co correctly extend a framework uh, given a, a functionality. So, actually, what you do today is that uh, you just take your framework and you start analyzing the different way in which uh, uh, this framework could fit your uh, your case study. So, first of all, from the developer point of view, we would like to understand how you should extend a given framework. But also, another problem that you have in this case, uh, when you try to uh, mine uh, mining, uh, libraries, is that uh, from the maintainer of the framework point of view, actually the, the maintainer doesn't know anything about how people are using uh, its li his library. So in the end, uh, it's possible that if you are a maintainer of a library and you would like to remove a functionality that uh, maybe no one is using, in the end, uh, you, you don't know this. I mean, uh, you, based on uh, comments or based on uh, what is your opinion, you are going to add or remove APIs. But in the end, uh, you don't know if, if really you are may, you are, uh, what, what will be the, the, the impact of your change. So when you would like to extend a framework, what you have, and uh, this is a definition that is uh, from, a, from a paper of a few years ago, is that you have an extension point, that is uh, the part that you, like, you should extend, and then you have an usage that actually uh, define how you are going to, to extend your, uh, your framework. But there are different kind of uh, extension point. For example, a really simple extension point is the one in which uh, actually in uh, your, uh, your code base uh, you're just using a method. 
This is the easiest thing. And actually, if you think about this, using, extending a framework in this way is not very different uh, to use uh, a library. The second thing that you will do is that uh, you not only use a method, but you also customize this method before using it. The third way is that you actually extend a class providing new functionalities. Now, if you have a look to this, uh, this picture, this is another work that uh, we, uh, and another part of uh, Intimals on which we are working on. In the end, it seems that the framework is different be, uh, with respect to the, the previous version that I show you, but if you think about it, it's not very different. Because in every case, we need an importer, and then we need a miner, and then we need a matcher, and then afterwards we need a visualization tool. So this is for telling you that in the end, uh, when you uh, try to mine uh, different, uh, different aspects of, uh, of uh, the source code, uh, in most of the cases, uh, mm, there are not so, so many differences, at least from a really high point of view. Now, uh, we performed a case study in which we uh, developed uh, an importer for Scala. Uh, so first of all, we are able to mine the, the source code. We are able to tag each part of the source code. And based on this tagging, what we are able is that, first of all, we are able to extract all the data that we need. So we are going, uh, we, we clone, uh, clone the projects. Then we compile the projects, we do type resolution, and just after this, we are able to uh, understand which are the extension points. After this part, we run our miner. With respect to the previous uh, approach, in this case, we run a, a subgraph mining algorithm. That is uh, a priori. And then we visualize the data. But what is important is that also in this case, we tried to evaluate our approach, mining several projects from Scala. We mined five different frameworks, so Spark, Akka, Mokito, Hadoop, and Play. And actually, we saw something that is, uh, was pretty much interesting. First of all, we saw that mining these kind of patterns is not very hard, but also the accuracy of these patterns in the end is very high. I mean, in most of the cases, we had that the accuracy was about 90-something percent. But one thing that, for example, we are not expecting is that uh, in most of the cases, uh, to extend a given class, uh, you, don't have, you don't have a lot of extension points. So in most of the cases, given a class, uh, you have at, at most four extension points. And also, we discovered that applying our miner, we were, most of the patterns that we were able to find were pretty much simple. So from this point of view, you can understand that, uh, as I told you before, you have a trade-off. The trade-off is that on the one hand, you have uh, that uh, your, your, extension, your uh, uh, patterns could be simple. On the other hand, you have the accuracy. So, the higher the accuracy, the simpler the patterns. But it's also, this means that what we have to do in the future is that we have to try to gather most, uh, the, some patterns that are uh, more complicated. Uh, this means that maybe our accuracy will, uh, will start failing, but it's also true that as a developer, you care about uh, uh, complex patterns because uh, if you are going to use a library, you don't need, uh, you don't need uh, this kind of technology if uh, your, uh, uh, the extension is easy. Last, I will talk to you about uh, uh, mining edits. So until this point, uh, until this point uh, I was talking about uh, snapshots. So you have uh, your snapshot, you analyze your snapshot. Uh, from your snapshot, you analyze, I mean, you analyze your uh, snapshot from a synthetic point of view or from uh, the point of view of a given library or a given framework. Now, when we talk about systematic edits, we're talking about uh, commits. So what we would like to do is that we will, let's consider a repository. And in this repository, we have uh, these changes, and then these changes, and then these changes. So we have uh, three instances of a change, 
but in the end we have only one systematic edit. So actually it could be interesting to know about these changes because uh, what we will do is that uh, we will, if uh, we have a, a new change and this change is different with respect to the, the systematic changes, it's, it's, more, it's probable that actually we are going to add a bug. So systematic edits uh, can be tedious and of course they are manually uh, mining this, uh, this data is very hard because you can just add errors. Now what we did is that we proposed a tool that actually based on a, a software project in Java is able to mine all the story of a project and uh, is able to, uh, it represents the source code changes as ST nodes and is able to apply a frequent item set mining that is uh, a bit different with respect to the first that uh, I show you uh, in the previous slides. Now, the applications are similar to the one that I showed you before. So first of all, you would like to detect uh, error-prone code, then you would like to assist developers, and the, the best thing would be to generate automatically some transformation based on uh, existing uh, instances. So, in this case, the, the approach is a bit different, because uh, we don't start from a snapshot, but uh, we start from a Git repository uh, with uh, different uh, uh, code revisions. Uh, then we apply a change distiller, so we are able to gather all the ID scripts. Then what we do is that, first of all, we group uh, these uh, ID scripts, then we apply an equivalence criteria, and all in the end, we apply our frequent item set mining algorithm. Now, let's consider an example, because it's much easier to understand. Let's consider that we have this commit. So in this commit, we, have a, a, we are adding two lines of code. Actually, these two lines of code are more or less the same. There's only a, a really small change. Now, so what we are doing? First of all, we are inserting an if statement. Then uh, we are inserting a method invocation. Afterwards, we are adding a this expression. And then we are... Uh, um, computing the equals on the, uh, on the argument that is P. Afterwards, we are returning, uh, we are returning uh, an, uh, an integer. Now, we can say that we have two different groups of changes. This one and this other one. But in the end, these two groups are doing the same. Now, what is the grouping criteria? First of all, what we are going to do is to group uh, the changes into transaction. Actually, what we do is that we, con we uh, group the changes based on the method on in which they are. So, we are going to have these two groups. Of course, there are uh, some lim limitations in this approach. Because, uh, our approach could be a bit naive in, the, in some cases. For example, because we are excluding uh, changes that occur across, the, across uh, methods, across different methods. The second thing is to understand, uh, given two different uh, group of changes, is to understand if they are the same. Otherwise, we cannot uh, compute the ID script. Now, the change equivalence criteria is based on the change type, the subject, and the context. The change type is pretty much easy to understand because, for example, in the case before, we are adding a lines of code, so in the end, uh, this is an insert. So, given uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this edit, in the end we know that this is the subject. And actually, what we do is that uh, we anonymize the identifiers, just because uh, otherwise it's, it's hard to uh, uh, gather together the, the patterns. And then finally, we define the context. But the context, if you think about, is just the place in which the subject occurs. So, given uh, these uh, two group of changes, 
we transform the, the edits in this kind of representation. <laughs> what we did, uh, one minute. One minute? One minute? Sure. Okay. okay. So what we did is that uh, we uh, evaluate the correctness of uh, the tool. And actually, we applied it to our code base uh, of our company that uh, is in Belgium. Um, we mine different repositories from uh, Android projects, actually. And uh, it's important to say that uh, for really understand if our ready scripts were correct or not, we had to manually evaluate the scripts. And uh, as I told you before, this is something that you always uh, have to do. I mean, one of the problems uh, in doing uh, research in academia is that actually sometimes we don't have real developers, and so it's, it's a bit tricky, but in the end we, we try to be developers. So what we, we, said from, uh, we, we un understand from uh, this study is that, first of all, in most of the cases, uh, uh, you have that the majority of uh, systematic edits have a few instances. So in the end, uh, you see that and this is one of the problems of uh, applying uh, uh, our mining algorithm. Because uh, having a uh, uh, few instances, it means that you have to, uh, you have to, to spend more uh, computational uh, uh, effort. Then another problem, because you, you cannot cut the search. Then another problem is that uh, uh, in most of the cases, you see that uh, uh, on average, three or four uh, ST level changes uh, disregards the number of instances. So that you have that larger instance size uh, can occur with the small number of instances. So in summary, we, are, we have a technique that is able to identify systematic edits. We, in uh, most of the cases, uh, um, we see that uh, in uh, 12.5% of commits, uh, they contain uh, systematic edits. And uh, mostly of these instances uh, are pretty, pretty much small, and, uh, but they can have a large size. As a future work, we are trying to explore the different com uh, configuration, and we are trying to mine f uh, for the specific type or uh, systematic edits. And also, we are trying to mine across commits. Because one of the problems that we have today is that uh, we mine a single commit per time. So if we have uh, 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 changes that are across commits, we are not able to, uh, to mine uh, this kind of information. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the question is that uh, when we were studying uh, systematic edits, if we see uh, if people... Uh, if you notice any pattern, uh -huh. uh, any patterns of idioms, uh -huh. you can say, okay, this is a good practice because ah. it's been added a lot of time. This is a bad practice because it's already... Yeah, okay. So the, the, the question is that if we were able to mine some best practice across uh, the systematic edits. Actually, this is a nice question. And, uh, Actually, is what we would like. It's the final goal of this kind of study. I mean, the the the, the final goal is to understand if there are uh, some best practice that you can apply everywhere. But what you have to understand is that in most of the cases, for the systematic edits, you have a, a really a small number of instances. It means that if you mine a software repository and you have, for example, for a systematic edit, you have uh, three instances. For example, in this case, we saw that for uh, 2,500 systematic edits, you have only three instances. So this cannot be our best practice. But one of the problems is that one of the problems applying this kind of technique is scalability. Because what we were doing is that for each project, we were going through the history, and we were analyzing all the, the history of just one project per time. Now, what you, would like, you, you should do for uh, having uh, an information like that is that you should mine a complete ecosystem so that you should be able to understand uh, whether there are uh, some, uh, uh, some best practice that uh, different developers are applying. Because in our case, 
most of the, the repositories are, uh, um, I mean, most of the people that uh, work on a repository uh, are not a lot. I mean, in most of the cases, uh, you don't have uh, thousands of uh, developers. So it's, it's really hard to, uh, to mine a best practice that you could apply everywhere. You, do you find that? Uh, okay, so the... Repeat the question, you have one minute to answer. Okay, so uh, the, the question is that if, uh, when mining uh, different, uh, uh, different projects, we found uh, uh, similar, uh, similar idioms. Actually, this is a nice question, and it's, it depends what... It, it still depends what is an idiom for you. Because, for example, uh, I could say that uh, uh, when you, one of the examples for an idiom is that, let's say that you have a project in Java 8 and you would like to go in, uh, to a, a new feature that you have in uh, Java 9, that what you can say is that, ah, okay, I will, uh, if I mine projects that are, are moving uh, from one version to another, I will find this idiom. So if you think that that is an idiom, then you will find this kind of idiom across projects. But there are some idioms that are, are very peculiar about, and uh, they are really about the developers that are incrementing the, the project. So in these cases, you will not find them. Great. So we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the second analyzer. Higher. Okay. Okay. I'm hungry. Hmm? I want to eat. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> Do you want some? No, thank you. <laughs> I will finish the presentation and then I go to take a sandwich.